Craving the perfect holiday snack? Check out Farmer Bill's Biltonk. Think beef jerky, but better. No sugar, no preservatives, just pure animal protein goodness. Crafted from premium grass-fed beef or bison and air-dried to perfection, Farmer Bill's Biltong is nutrient-packed, energy-dense, and perfect for an on-the-go treat or a standout snack for your next party. My favorite is the original bison, but the other flavors like the original beef, smokehouse, and spicy chili have me second-guessing that choice more than once. Visit FarmerBillsProvisions.com to grab a one-pound slab or a variety pack and use code BIZBIT10 for 10% off. Farmer Bills Biltong, don't be the two-liter guy at this year's Christmas party. What we have always hoped for at Proof of Reserves is that we can become self-regulatory and impose our own regimes versus having regulators come in and impose what they think is appropriate when, you know, usually they don't do a good job of that and we kind of get screwed. Welcome to the Business Bitcoinization Show, the show dedicated to helping you enrich your life and grow your business with Bitcoin, the hardest money on planet Earth. I'm your host, Josh Friedemann, and our guest today is Sam Abbasi, who is the founder and CEO of Hoseki. Now, Hoseki is an organization that you might want to consider partnering with. They are a business that provides proof of funds for your Bitcoin. In other words, they let the lending institution you want to interact with know that you have Bitcoin, but it allows you to retain full custody of that Bitcoin. Sam previously worked on Bitcoin products at Fidelity, focusing on open source, self-custody solutions, and proof of reserves. Now, of course, before we get to our interview with Sam, we have this week's Bitcoin Meetup Spotlight. And this week, we're going to Lexington, Kentucky, which is a place that is near and dear to my heart because that is where I spent my college years. It's a beautiful place that I would recommend that you visit at some point in your life. And now if you do, you'll know exactly where you can go to find other Bitcoiners. The Lexington Bitcoin Meetup has been connecting Bitcoiners in the Bluegrass State since 2015. They're a weekly Bitcoin-only meetup that consists of a casual atmosphere with other like-minded individuals who share the common belief that Bitcoin will change the world. They'd love to invite you to come out and join them, whether you're local or just passing through. They meet every Tuesday night at the Cellar in Lexington, Kentucky, and try to have guest speakers on the first Tuesday of the month. Check them out at lexingtonbitcoin.org and follow them on Twitter at lexbitcoin.org org to learn more about their upcoming events. Those links are in the show notes below, along with a list of other local Bitcoin meetups across the United States, in case you don't want to wait until the next time you're traveling through Kentucky to meet up with other Bitcoiners. I encourage you to check out that link and find out what kind of Bitcoin community is happening in your area as well. Now, we're going to get to our interview with Sam right after this. Business owners, unlock the benefits Bitcoin has to offer your business with the Bitcoin for Business Quick Start Guide. This 27-page guide highlights the six ways you can grow your business with Bitcoin. Check it out in the show notes. Sam, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. So I'd like to start off every single interview with a few questions that help us to get to know you a little bit better and give us some insight for our own lives. Are you ready for these? Yeah, let's do it. When and how did you first learn about Bitcoin? Uh, first time I heard about it was 2014. I think it's probably a typical story with a lot of other people as well. A college buddy told me about it. Um, but, uh, you know, I wasn't into finance or investing at the time, so I completely disregarded it. Um, you really would have to explain the political significance of Bitcoin for me to actually care. And I just got the financial selling points. Um, so I was still trying to figure out what to do with my life. And that low time preference thinking and investments weren't exactly close to mind. But, but 2016, 17 was when I actually got onboarded, when I actually started to work in the space. Um, so I was going through a career change and the space was clearly taking off. This was during the, the rally of 2017. And um, a friend of mine turned me on to the Noted podcast. Um, and then I kind of understood the international ramifications of it. And, and yeah, I was, I was just, I was sold. What's an insight or fact about Bitcoin that you wish that everyone understood? Yeah, so I've got, I've got two, um, a philosophical one and a technical one. So the philosophical fact is that just because buying and holding Bitcoin uh, is speculative by nature or, or, or simply putting your hopes into Bitcoin without even buying necessarily is speculative by nature because you're speculating that this this will be somewhere that it's not today and uh, it'll be doing things that it's not doing today. Um, that doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. And, and, and most importantly, it doesn't mean that it's sinful. You know, if you're dissatisfied with the system and that applies to a large swath of people and, you know, probably the overwhelming majority of people. And I, and I mean that both locally 
um, you know, nationally as well as internationally, um, then this is, you know, a legitimate means to correct it or at least ameliorate it. It doesn't have to be the best solution. Uh, It doesn't mean that it is. It it might not be. It's just the most functional one. And then the uh, technical point is that your Bitcoins don't actually exist anywhere physically. Uh, They're they're, they're not in your wallet. What's what's in your wallet is the tool required to authorize or, you know, as I like to say, sort of flex or express ownership over your funds. Um, And what you've really got in your wallet is a digital pen that can produce signatures. And just like physical checks, these transactions are, are invalid unless signed. Um, so the signature is what proves that this is true and, and you authorize these movement of funds. So talk to me a little bit more about the digital pin side of things. Is that something that you've developed? Where did you get that idea? And also, would you recommend people start talking about private keys in those terms, uh, like in metaphors that people more clearly understand? Yeah, I think it would be helpful. I mean, even that's a little bit tough because you know we're talking about cryptography concepts. These aren't even Bitcoin concepts. These are just public private key um, cryptography concepts. And I think that's part of, uh, um, you know, the, like dare I say problem with, with, with Bitcoin in space generally is that this was built by low level, you know, protocol engineers and, uh, and that sort of like product layer hasn't really been built out or hasn't been built out yet. And so you have end users that don't understand these technical concepts being exposed to vocabulary. that's very, very technical and, and it's true in a literal sense, but, um, you know, it's not exactly true at the operational sort of UX sense. Yeah, I think it would be helpful if people start talking about private keys, though. And then did you come up with that metaphor or maybe where did you get that that idea or insight? Yeah, I did. This was while I think this is while I was working at Fidelity. I, I was honestly having a hard time trying to explain uh, what a Bitcoin transaction is and how it works. And I was trying to explain this to the the more gray hairs in the company. And, and I just couldn't figure out an analogy. And um and when I thought about it with respect to signatures, that's when it kind of clicked. I mean, you know, as opposed to account-based models where there's debits and credits, uh, Bitcoin has a UTXO model, and that's very sort of unintuitive. Um, normally, when you're spending funds, you're spending funds from one account, and that gets debited from that account. And, you know, you see the subtraction. It's very simple and it's very clear. But with Bitcoin, you're talking about UTXO models. You're effectively destroying Bitcoins every time you spend them. And... A UTXO is an unspent transaction output, but again, that's not a very intuitive thing. So I like to think of it more like claims. Like when you say you own Bitcoin, you technically have the authority to move those funds. You don't have those coins sitting somewhere. You know, they don't necessarily have your name on them in your wallet. What you have are what we call private keys that can generate signatures that verify the claim on these funds. So if I have a UTXO that says, okay, Sam can spend these two Bitcoin. What's required is Sam's signature for those Bitcoins to be spent. And what I do is I consume that sort of claim and I consume it in its entirety and I create a whole new claim. And that's a very destructive and violent thing that's happening. Um, and that's why it's very dangerous to, you know, spending Bitcoin is, I guess, dangerous because if you, you know, demarcate the incorrect address, you've consumed this state of ownership that you currently have into this new state. However, the person that can spend this new state doesn't exist because you put the wrong address, for example. And so that's why it's so consequential. And that's why self-custody is, you know, uh, quite a technical thing that, you know, should be learned before you really engage in it. Third question is this, what's the Bitcoin resource that you most recommend to other people? (laughs) Probably, probably living in a criminally inflationary country like Lebanon or Venezuela is probably the best sort of education you can get. No, but sh- short of that is, um, I love mastering Bitcoin by Andreas Antonopoulos. That's that was my resource. It, it's great because it's it is very technical, but you can read it as a non technical person and un- understand what's going on. I mean, uh, he explains things in layman terms, um, and I think he does a pretty decent job of going through the entire Bitcoin stack from really I think it's monetary principles in the beginning all the way. I think that book even gets into lightning a little bit as well. So I'd recommend that book. Beyond Bitcoin, what's a resource or an idea that's been beneficial to you or your business recently? Probably the idea of restructuring or rebuilding. You know, I think most startups have some contrived call to action that results in changing the world, quote unquote. Um, For us, and probably for other Bitcoin companies, it's a bit different. We don't think that we're changing the world, right? Like every, again, every startup is kind of quote unquote mission driven. We think Bitcoin is changing the world and we're along for the ride. So for us, it's like this thing is happening. Let's figure out what's needed to help make it happen. 
Finally, we have our arbitrary but insightful question, which is this. As a general life principle, is it better to ask why or why not? Yeah, honestly, I, I think this question is brilliant. Um, I, I couldn't come up with what I consider an adequate sort of philosophical answer to the question. Um, I, I always ask why not. Um, I think you maybe get a more direct answer by asking why not. Uh, so it's like, you know, why would you jump off this cliff? Well, you know, you probably get an existential answer. I'm upset with my life or, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, going through some problems, it's more existential, but you know, why, why wouldn't you jump off this cliff? Well, because you might die. <laughs> it's a little bit more direct. Yeah. But yeah, I think, I think if you're, you know, in the business that I'm in, which is kind of like idea generation and execution, it's, it's really, yeah, I, I, I just, I just ask why not again? I can't, I can't really distill that any further, but that just makes the most sense to me. Meet Linkster, your premier Bitcoin-focused advisor. Linkster caters to businesses, institutions, family offices, and high net worth individuals. They merge your unique financial goals and needs with Linkster's Bitcoin expertise to craft your own sustainable plan to preserve and grow the value of your hard-earned profits and retained earnings. And Linkster is not just advice, it's tailored execution. Connect directly with the founder by visiting Linkster.com. That's L-Y-N-C-S-T-E-R. Dot com Linkster. Secure your future with Bitcoin. Today's episode of Business Bitcoinization is proudly brought to you by Vellus Commerce, where the future of business technology meets Bitcoin. As we journey through the era of Bitcoin and its transformational impact on businesses, there's one name that stands out. Vellus Commerce. Whether you're looking to build a cutting edge website, a seamless mobile app, or custom software, Vellus is your go to team. They've been diving deep into the world of Bitcoin since 2014, making them one of the most experienced groups for integrating Bitcoin and Lightning payments into a variety of digital platforms. But here's what truly sets them apart Vellus Commerce doesn't just build, they bring a wealth of knowledge to ensure your project success from day one. Their team understands the nuances of Bitcoin, ensuring that your business stays ahead of the curve. And for all business Bitcoinization listeners out there, Vellus Commerce is offering a free consultation to kickstart your project the right way. So if you're ready to future proof your business in the coming age of hyper Bitcoinization, head over to VellusCommerce.com or reach out on Twitter at Vellus Commerce. Let's make Make sure your business thrives in the Bitcoin era. Well, Sam, we're here today to talk about your business, Hoseki, focused on proof of funds. Share with us about Hoseki, what it is and the problem that it's helping to solve. So the problem we're trying to solve is you being able to use your Bitcoin without having to move or sell it. That's what I'm passionate about. I had this like sort of call to action back in 2018. Um, I think I was listening to Rabbit Hole Recap or, or one of these podcasts. and sort of said to myself, I mean, I don't really want to, you know, do anything with my Bitcoin until I can rent it to a government. I don't know what that meant. I still don't necessarily know exactly what the mechanics would would be required in order to make that real. But I felt and I still feel that I hold one of the most important assets or really things discovered by humankind. And I should be empowered by that. And I'm not empowered by that currently. When I wanted to go get a mortgage, you know, I was treated like a second class citizen. Uh, I had this magic internet money that no one cared about. And more, more importantly, I didn't have a way to actually prove to them that I owned this thing. They could show my wallet on my phone, but I didn't have, you know, a real, uh, a, a, a real sort of seamless way to do so. You know, I suggested, well, I could take a screenshot of my Trezor UI, for example. And uh, that, that wasn't accepted. I've heard some people have had success with that, but that wasn't accepted. And the alternative was, uh, well, you know, Maybe what we can do is have you send funds to, uh, you know, a Coinbase account and print out a statement. And I thought that was just egregious on so many levels. So I, yeah, it was, it was born out of frustration. I, I was just frustrated that I, and look, maybe I got scammed, but I was told that Bitcoin's great. And, uh, and I couldn't do something that I thought was very basic with this great thing that I had. So the problem we're solving, I think is very simple. And that's why I like it. I, I, I like simple solutions for, uh, well, for ideally simple problems, and this is quite simple. It's it's very um, it's you know I, I kind of described it as being very dumb, but tongue in cheek because a lot of brilliant things are rather simple. But that was sort of the inspiration. I, I I wanted to be able to do something with my Bitcoin without having to sell it. Mainly in this case, get a mortgage um, or even move it. I just wanted to be able to basically show up a piece of paper and say, Hey, look, I own these assets. I'm good for the money. Please give me this loan. 
just out of curiosity, did you end up having success in any way using Bitcoin for a loan in that experience? Or were you so frustrated by the fact that you couldn't use it that Hoseki was kind of uh, born in your mind? The market changed and some other things in my life personally changed. So I decided not to go through with it. So I personally didn't do it. We've had we had customers successfully already use their Bitcoin as um, proof of assets to get loans extended to them. Um, but no, my my in my in my own personal case, I was just so fed up with it that I figured, well, there must be some 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 solution for this. Yeah. The other thing I was going to mention that I lost my train of thought with was, and I'm assuming this applies to any industry. When you're running a company, you're an evangelist for the thing that you're building. But you know, I think in our case, we're also evangelists for the product that we're building things on top of. In this case, Bitcoin. And what I love with Hoseki is that, you know, I can explain this concept to anyone, be it a Bitcoiner or anyone in the crypto space generally or not. And they'll understand what we're building because proof of assets is a just basic characteristic of any asset class. Um, it's not, you know, a Bitcoin specific thing. So I'm curious about some of the things that you've seen so far, maybe conversations you've been having with early users or investors. What are the use cases? Obviously, you have something like a mortgage. Is it really any type of loan having some sort of more legitimate, quote unquote, proof of funds will will make that more possible and more accessible to traditional financial institutions? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of this is sort of a guerrilla campaign where, you know, what I expect people to do is bombard these institutions and these organizations with Hoseki letters. Um, which is what they've been doing thus far. But once we launch, we hope that expands and, you know, 100 X's where they become comfortable enough to assess these assets the way they should be assessed. That's our goal. One of the things that I stress when you just want to, you know, use our statements is, you know, this is supposed to act as an additional financial data point in addition to your other financial data points. So, you know, the idea isn't that you can have a loan extended to you simply because you own Bitcoin on that alone um, at this stage of, you know, maybe the maturation of where this asset is just in its life cycle. But it's more that, you know, maybe I have some income, I have some, I have some other assets, but I also have Bitcoin and mm -hmm. that should bolster and that should give me, you know, a bit of a better rating, a bit of a better profile in order to actually have, you know, loans extended to me. The last time I was in my local bank, I had to go in there. It was frustrating. I had to get a wire transfer and it took way longer than it should have. And it makes me excited about a future where we more easily control all of our funds. But I did ask them at the end of the conversation, I asked them if they were interested in some sort of service like Hoseki and uh, particularly for a loan, you know, would it be helpful to see proof of funds when it comes to uh, any Bitcoin that I might own? And the look that that guy gave me was just this look of pity. And so something's got to give in our, our system because right now, uh, Bitcoiners and non-Bitcoiners frequently look on each other with, with pity. But I'm, so, I'm sort of curious, like, what are some of the conversations you've been having as you've been talking with banks? Obviously, some people are sending letters. Uh, are people open to it? Uh, what are some of the reservations? Interested to know some of what you've been finding there with your market research. Yeah, and, and this idea uh, of looking at each other with pity is, is, um, is an interesting place. I mean, I sort of view Bitcoin as this third world country, this developing market, a country in the global south, whatever the, whatever the term is now. Um, because this is a problem that people in those countries have. They have what's called dead capital. They have you know, informal assets that they don't have ways of expressing ownership over. So they aren't able to actually use these assets. You know, people in Egypt are actually quite rich, but they simply don't have the proper framework in order to express their property rights. So I just see Bitcoin as, you know, a, a digital version of this. And, you know, I, I think what we're building, something like this will have to exist. And so that's why I said we're kind of riding on Bitcoin's coattails. As Bitcoin becomes more dominant, as it becomes more important, both nationally and internationally, you're going to have to have a platform in order to express ownership. So some of the lenders we've spoken to are uncomfortable. Um, to be honest, the overwhelming majority are comfortable. What we're selling is transparency, selective transparency in order to have more robust financial agreements with people that want to engage in financial agreements. So the ones that are apprehensive at the moment, frankly, are the minority, at least with the conversations we've had. And maybe we've been lucky in being introduced to the right people, but they're frankly rather, they're not very tech forward generally. So, you know, if you're not tech forward generally, Bitcoin, you know, at least for people in the West, you know, it, 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 it uh, in your, in, your, in your hierarchy of needs, it's actually quite high up there. But the overwhelming majority of lenders are, you know, they, they, they want to deploy their capital. They want to find credit worthy or quote unquote credit worthy um, individuals. And 
you know, I think that may be becoming tougher and tougher just more broadly. And so they're willing to take more risks with other non-traditional type of investors like us. But they've been receptive to this idea of allowing more transparent proofs of ownership in order to in order to to, to uh, deploy their capital. I've got to think that having a background with Fidelity helps in some of those conversations as well. When you were at Fidelity, you know, I don't know how much you want to talk about that previous work, but when you're working on proof of fund stuff, was it Bitcoin specific back then? Or I'm just kind of curious to know some of what you were thinking back then and how that's helped you as you're building Hoseki right now. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, my background, my family's background is in property and property management, which is why Bitcoin as property makes a lot of sense to me. We're I don't, I don't really deal in high finance, as I mentioned in the beginning with kind of how I got into Bitcoin. I'm not a very sophisticated, I'm not sophisticated as a financial investor at all. So Fidelity, frankly, was, um, I was, I was someone that had a lot of, had a lot of infield experience um, in the crypto space at that time. And that was very valuable to them because they're, you know, a massive company that has a lot of internal hiring. So, uh, so that was very much kind of being a stranger in a strange world for me. I've never been in that environment before, never thought I'd be working on Wall Street. Um, Bitcoin brought me there. The work that I did there with Proof of Reserves was a paper that I wrote with Nick Carter, um, KPMG, Deloitte, and a few other accounting and auditing firms um, around how an exchange would conduct a Proof of Reserves um, if they wanted to. So uh, that paper, I think it's like a 50-page paper. It was written with the um, Digital Chamber of Commerce. Um, so you can find it on their website or on, maybe on Nick's website as well. So that paper explains the history of Proof of Reserves um, talk about Mt. Gox and just exchange hacks and uh, insolvencies more broadly. This happened before this last summer, obviously, is uh, it's, it's very much um, uh, relevant. But um, I wrote the tech specs. The tech spec was, you know, if an exchange wanted to conduct a proof of reserves, here are the tools required. Here are the different methods. Here are examples to open source code and as well as exchanges that are currently either historically that have done so or do, are doing so today. CoinFloor has, has been kind of like the hallmark example. They were, they were recently acquired by Coin Corner, uh, but they were conducting a monthly proof of reserves. Uh, so that was really more of an artifact that regulators could look towards or that we could throw at regulators once they want to get caught up on the subject. What we have always hoped for proof of reserves is that we can become self-regulatory and impose our own regimes versus having regulators come in and impose what they think is appropriate when, you know, usually they don't do a good job of that and we kind of get screwed. I'm curious to know what it looks like for someone right now who's listening to this podcast, if they're interested in using Koseki. Uh, first of all, is it ever relevant for businesses? And then second of all, if they are going to be doing it for themselves, what does that look like? So definitely relevant for businesses, um, small to medium-sized businesses. That's We've been getting a lot of inbound from them because they have their own capital requirements and you know, they may have Bitcoin on their balance sheet, but they have the same problem where they're self-custodying their assets, but they, again, don't have a way to actually prove this. Um, so for a user that wants to prove assets today, uh, what they're going to do is they're going to connect their accounts. And w- what we try and do is sort of simplify a lot of this terminology. I'm a hobbyist. You're, I think, by definition, a hobbyist by sort of, you know, having uh, a business around, around around Bitcoin at this stage. And so we're willing to take a, a less than ideal user experience because we love the thing and we're willing to go through a less than ideal experience in order to use the thing. Uh, but I don't think that applies to most people. So one thing we've done is abstract the language a bit. So when I say accounts, I mean wallets and I mean exchange accounts. And I also mean individual Bitcoin addresses. But a user would either sign into an exchange account that they have, Coinbase, uh, FTX, Kraken. I think we support some around um, 11 or 12 exchanges at the moment. Um, or they can connect their hardware wallet. Uh, Ledger, Cold Card, Trezor, KeepKey, uh, Bitbox. They connect one of these devices or they can provide a signature for an individual account, which proves their ownership. Once they've done that, on the dashboard, they'll see, you know, their recent transactional um, activity. But most importantly, the empowerment bit is the fact that you can export a report that will have your name, your address, and your selected Bitcoin holdings. So, uh, you know, we're privacy first Bitcoiners. We understand the apprehension around things like this. These are you know, your own sort of self-sovereign assets and you're custodying them. So security is of utmost importance. So everything you do is selective. So if you've connected, let's say, three hardware devices to exchanges, um, you can select which ones you want in the statement, whenever you generate a statement. So you want, let's say you've got, you know, two Bitcoin on a cold card and you've got one Bitcoin on the Trezor and you've got some Bitcoin somewhere else, but you just want those two and you just want a statement for those two. You select those two, they'll be reflected on the statement. And the statements look just like bank statements. 
Um, so they have a you know beginning monthly balance, ending monthly balance, deposits, withdrawals, and then all the different accounts that you're selecting there. One important thing as well is when you select a self custody device. So when you select a, 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 a Trezor, for example, Trezor isn't written on the statement. We have a randomized account number, and that's designed in order to protect yourself a little bit. Um, you don't need to disclose wallet details. What we want Hoseki to become is sort of this dumb zero knowledge proof where whoever is receiving the output of what we're verifying basically get a check mark and say, okay, well, this is true without having to know all the details of what makes that true. But once you have the statement, you're not, you're now, you basically, we've given you, you know, um, we've, 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 we've empowered you. The idea is for you to now be able to walk through the door of a bank or any other organization with your shoulders back and chin held up high, basically demanding money because you've got one of the most important things in existence. So if someone likes this idea and they want to see if their bank or whatever lending institution they're using is open to this, or maybe even using Hoseki currently, what do they need to do? Just reach out to that organization? Do they reach out to you? Do you provide them with some language to use? Curious to know about some of those next steps there. Yeah, the statement's got everything on it. It's got a, it has a section with terminology about what self-custody is, what exchange accounts are, and kind of how we uh, make our assessments. Um, we have a directory of now I think it's close to 80 lenders and brokers that we've spoken with that will at least assess these statements and consider them. Again, it's not a guarantee of a loan, but it's just the fact that you're not going to be rejected when you walk in the door. We have found that a lot of this is trial and error. A lot of it depends on the relationship you have with the lender or the broker, at least in that use case. So if they already know you, they're more inclined to accept the statement. If you're a random person coming to the door, it might be more 50-50. So again, it, it really just seems to depend on on uh, what the relationship is with your with your given counterparty. This may be introducing a topic that for people who aren't uh, really in the Bitcoin space, uh, it may not be something they thought about. But my guess is if, if you have been in the Bitcoin space for a while, you'll probably be thinking at this point, what about a company like Ledin? How do you connect with them? How do you integrate with them? Or do they have their own process like this and you're more... Um, uh, Hoseki is better for those traditional financial institutions. Yeah, so we're partnered with Ledin, um, and you know, we have a Rolodex that we're going through, things that we're going to announce soon as well. So the profile of someone that wants to get a loan from Ledin is a little bit different, though. In our case, what we're saying is you may not, again, you you, you really don't want to move your Bitcoin. Um, I think that's probably the most important caveat. So in our case, you're getting a traditional loan because for whatever reason, that's you know more amenable to your current situation and you have your Bitcoin and you want to be able to get a better rate, for example. Uh, whereas with Ledin um, or Unchain, you're, you know, more inclined to get a direct sort of like, you know, what's 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 called a Bitcoin loan and you're willing to actually send funds into that multi-sig address. However, we, we're, we're partnering with Ledin um, so we can refer clients directly to Ledin. Um, we're working on some more sophisticated ways of maybe even getting better rates for some of these customers um, and providing a better sort of, again, a better a better profile of um, the fact that you know you may be depositing this amount of Bitcoin in order to get a loan, but you happen to have you know that same amount of Bitcoin in self custody that you're not using for the loan. Well, maybe the fact that you have that Bitcoin and there's transparency over the fact that you have that Bitcoin um, might give you a better rate because um, they can see that you have other assets that are serviceable within within theory at least. So I think it's a different it's a different borrower profile, but we are working with them, and I think there's. I think there's more synergies than what we currently have laid out. I think proof of funds is a, a fairly straightforward concept as you've described it today. It's a little bit different when you're you're working with Bitcoin. People are learning things. Um, they're they're trying to balance privacy with this pristine asset that they own. What do you see Hoseki doing in the future? Is it just that hey, we want to be the number one proof of funds business, or do you see this platform being built out into other use cases in the future? I, I honestly think there's a bunch of other use cases that I haven't really even sort of mapped out well enough. I think there's some obvious stuff. I mean, even out the gate, like we, so uh, we're launching our product, we're launching the statements product at the end of October. Uh, so, but we've been having alpha users test our product and we've been iterating for the last couple months, but we've already had use cases come out of the wild that I hadn't considered. For example, residency applications and, and, and exit visas, which uh, it's it's my favorite use case so far because the narrative is so beautiful with what Bitcoin is. Um, you're talking about you know these are these are these are people that are trying to become global citizens uh, using a global jurisdictionless asset in order to in order to be approved. So for the residency use case, you have Bitcoin, 
you self custody, you have these assets and you have to prove to the country that you're trying to become a resident of that you have sufficient assets, but you don't have a way to do it. So here's Hoseki. So we've been helping, we've been helping customers there, but even exit visas, you know, we have one user in Nigeria that can't leave the country unless they can prove that they have sufficient funds to support themselves abroad. Uh, it's the same thing. They're self-sovereign and they want to have access to the world, but they aren't able to because they don't have a way to prove ownership of this self-sovereign asset. So in the future, yeah, I mean, I think there's a bunch of things. We have a few products laid out that we're going to launch later this year. But I honestly view this future Bitcoin standard stack of the world that we envision with Hoseki as that bottom layer. I think we're solving a very simple but a very important problem um, where once you're able to actually utilize and express ownership of these basic property rights that Bitcoin itself natively offers as part of the protocol, it's going to unleash some really powerful, some really powerful use cases. Well, Sam, I appreciate you coming on today. We'll probably have conversations in the future as you continue to expand what Hoseki is doing. Before we finish up, are there any final thoughts that you have and then let people know where they can find out more about Hoseki? Yeah, just, uh, you know, it's a bear market. So take advantage, talk to people, ask questions and learn. This is the best time. Honestly, you should be ecstatic. And otherwise you can reach me at, um, I'm at Sam Abbasi on Twitter. That's two B's and two S's. Um, and Sam at Hoseki.app. Uh, you can find Hoseki at Hoseki.app. That's the URL. And you can sign up for our wait list. That's still live at the moment in order to try out our new, our new product. All right, Sam, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Joshua. All right, friends, it's a wrap. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Business Bitcoinization Show. If you want to reach out to either me or Sam or give Hoseki a try for yourself, you can find all those links in the show notes below. And if you know of another business owner who could benefit from hearing about how they can use Bitcoin in their business, please share this show with them. As always, keep building, keep growing, and until next time, keep living and leading well. If you're a regular listener of the podcast, thank you. If you want to take a further step in your support for the show, you can help us grow by listening on Fountain, a value for value podcast app on iOS or Android. If you hear something you like that you disagree with or anything else, you can share it by sending some sats and adding a comment with your thoughts. Some of you have already done this and I appreciate it. I'm going to begin reading your boosts on upcoming episodes. So if you have some insight or value to add, let the people know. Getting started with Fountain is easy. You can add Bitcoin to your Fountain wallet by using your fiat accounts or any lightning wallet and one of my favorite features is that once you're using the app you can earn stats just by listening on fountain check out the link in the show notes to get started with fountain today